Hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm Melinda, and I will be talking about artificial intelligence. So to jump right in, does anybody know what the reference of that poster is? Yes, and why am I mentioning that? Yeah. Um, so it comes, um, it's basically the first time that the term robot was introduced to the English language. It actually comes from the Czech word roboti, which means surf labor. And um, this play by Karl Chapek, if I'm pronouncing that right, was written in 1920, and it's um, about a factory where robots are made. And it tells the story of how a robot rebellion leads to the end of the human race. So quite happy play, I guess. Um, so ever since the Industrial Revolution, we've had a fascination with machines coming to life and causing our downfall as a species. Um, but, as our but as our technology um, evolves, our stories about technology is evolving as well. So just thinking of recent movies, we've got Her, where a guy falls in love with an operating system. Chappie, where a police robot is given new programming and begin, becomes the first robot to think and feel for himself. And we've got Ex Machina, which is basically all about a Turing test, an experiment to evaluate whether that robot can be considered alive. Um, so I'm a huge movie geek, but in my day job, I'm a developer, a Ruby developer to be specific. And I work at a company called FutureLearn. Um, you might have heard of us a um, couple meetups back. Um, we had Nikki Thompson here talking about FutureLearn as well. And we are a social learning platform. So we work together with universities and cultural institutions to create free <coughs> online courses. So our mission is to pioneer the best learning experiences for everyone everywhere. Now, what this means though is that as a company, our team is encouraged to learn more about the theory and the principles of how we're building these learning experiences. Um, so that means we have internal talks about pedagogy. We are encouraged to take online courses on our own platform or elsewhere. And we have learning technologists working together with us to create these best learning experiences. So my own background is in artificial intelligence. Um, back when I was at university, I specialized in AI and, and machine learning. And I, um, my master's research focused on facial expression recognition. So what I realized, though, from listening to these internal pedagogy talks is that how machines, the artificial learn, is very, very similar to how people, the unartificial learn. Um, so that's pretty much what this talk is about. Um, just looking at some of the basic ideas of artificial intelligence and applying that to the, unartif uh, the unartificial. So to start off, before we can get a look at artificial intelligence, what is intelligence? So how do we define that? Um, what makes something or someone intelligent? So I did what every geek would do and looked it up in the Dungeons and Dragons handbook. <laughs> and we get this quote. Intelligence determines how well your character learns and reasons. This ability is important for wizards because it affects how many spells they can cast, how hard their spells are to resist, and how powerful their spells can be. It's also important for any character who wants to have a wide assortment of skills. Now, obviously the parts about wizards and spells aren't really relevant to us here, but these parts are. How well your character learns and reasons, and having a wide assortment of skills. And the reason why I also pick out the Dungeons and Dragons handbook is the fact that it puts intelligence next to wisdom. As a kid, I remember think, looking at this and thinking, aren't those two the same thing? Aren't, aren't they the same thing? But intelligence is not about being intellectual. It's not about how much you know. So here's another proper definition. Um, and again, it's about not just having knowledge or skills. It's about knowing how to obtain them, how to reason about them, and how to use them. So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, what do we mean with it? So we actually have, it actually has two meanings. <coughs> On one side, we use the term to describe the intelligence of actual machines or software. 
On the other hand, we use it to describe the field of study that looks at creating intelligence within machines or software. Um, so within the research area, we've got four different approaches that we can think of um, looking at <coughs> implementing AI. Um, so these are kind of the four areas. There's a little bit of overlap between some of them, but in general, most of the approaches fall in one of these areas. So on the one side, we have systems that think like humans and systems that act like humans. So this is very much intelligence compared to us as humans. And on the other side, we have systems that think rationally and systems that act rationally. So this is very much about the ideal concept of intelligence. So a system is rational if it does the right thing. But how do you determine what the right thing is? And then we can split it this way. Systems that think like humans and systems that think rationally. And on the bottom, systems that act like humans <coughs> and systems that act rationally. So it's very much thinking about thinking versus acting or thought versus behavior. So the first area is systems that think like humans. Um, and this is the approach of cognitive science. So in here, we're looking at trying to discover a theory of the mind and being able to recreate this as a computer program. So it's this idea of if we understand how our brains work, we can recreate it. And it's vice versa as well. So if once we know how um, computer programs think, can we get a better understanding of our brains and how humans think? The next area is systems that think rationally. So this is very much the logicist approach. Um, so it's completely rooted in logic. And this is pretty much the traditional classic AI um, that the AI field started off with. Um, so this approach kind of goes from the um, perspective that any problem can be described in logical notation. And once you have a problem in logical notation, that means that you can easily solve it because any problem that's described in logical notation can be solved. So this was mainly used for, for puzzle solving, so things like chess playing and stuff like that. But the problem is not every problem can actually be described in logical notation. Um, so there's a lot of things that it doesn't work for. And also on the same side, there's not every single problem can actually be solved. Not everything has a single answer. There are some cases that it's a bit more fuzzy than that. So the third area that we're looking at is systems that act like humans. And this is very much where the Turing test comes in. So I'm assuming everyone here has heard about it. Yeah, lots of nods. So it was introduced in the 1950s, and it was Turing's response to the question, can machines think? And rather than focusing on what we actually mean with thinking, he proposed another question. Can machines do what we as humans do? So he proposed the imitation game, which is based on a party game from the 1950s, because I don't think anyone here has ever heard of the imitation game as a party game. But the idea is, if you have an observer or a judge um, talking with both a human and a computer, will that observer know which one is a human and which one is a computer? So it has a couple of limitations, though. So the way it worked is that um, the judge and the participants all conversed just by text. So it's all text-based. Um, and not everything that humans do is text-based. We do a ton <coughs> of other stuff. We da oh, sorry. dance and paint and sing and run and tons of other things that we do that isn't through just conversation. Um, so rather than attempting to answer the question that Turing initially proposed, which was, can machines do what we as humans can do, um, he's actually answering the question, can machines appear to respond in text as humans do? Which isn't quite as catchy. Um, next to that, there's some other limitations to it. There's some human behavior that is unintelligent. Um, so for instance, think about the way that people make grammar mistakes and typos. So the initial chatbots that won the Turing test they did so by just randomly throwing some typos in and pretending that they were human in that sense. 
And on the other side, there are some intelligent behavior that is inhuman, like being able to cal calculate mathematical equations really quickly. And a lot of the chatbots initially also realized, well, the, the designers of the chatbots initially realized that this was a limitation, so they introduced ways to not be able to solve those equations. So this very much introduced the idea of artificial stupidity. Since dumbing down an algorithm for the sake of passing it off as human. And I find this rather anticlimactic. I mean, yes, it's all about creating a intelligence which is as smart as humans, but is that really what we want? Do we really want a machine that is only just as dumb as we are? Um, so the final area that we're looking at, which is more appropriate for us, is systems that act rationally. So this is the idea of intelligent agents. So a rational agent is one that acts to achieve the best outcome, or when there is uncertainty, the best expected outcome. So here's a very basic diagram of an agent. Um, and when I talk about agent, I'm talking about it in a abstract sense. So this is not necessarily a standalone computer program or an app or anything like that. This is more an idea of a agent. Um, so an agent exists within an environment. It has sensors with which it can observe that environment and it has effectors with which it can act on the environment. And it has this huge white box um, that it can make the, so that it can make decisions about these observations and what actions to take. So when we're talking about humans, we can think about it in the same way. We've got a human in an environment, and we've got sensors, which are our five senses, so sound, sight, smell, taste, and touch. And we've got effectors, so that's anything that we use to act on our environment, so our hands, our voice, etc. And again, we've got this big black box to decide what actions to take. So look, going back to the artificial, this is a simple reflex agent. So this is the most basic type of agent that we can think of. So in this case, we have observations and we create a state of what the current world is. We then have condition action rules. So these are just simple if then rules. And based on these two things, we can decide what action it should take. So a simple example of this is email, filter, email filters. So again, I'm talking about agents in a very abstract sense. So in this case, our environment is your email inbox. Your sensors are the sense that it will get an incoming email. Um, and once it gets an email from a certain email address, it will apply a filter, um, a label to that email. So it's a very simple concept. So again, we can apply the same thing to the unartificial. So who here has heard of Pavlov? Right. So he was a Russian physiologist and mainly known for his work in classi classical conditioning. So he trained um, dogs to associate the sound of a buzzer with food. Um, so a couple of years back, I tried to do the same thing with my cats. So this is Casey and Dusty, and they get hungry all the time. And they'll get really, really annoying when they're hungry. Um, so I wondered, could I actually train them like Pavlov did? Um, so I tried it out. So they started off like normal cats, and whenever they smell food, they'd know that they'd be getting it soon, and they'd run off to the kitchen um, showing that they want the food. So then I started training them with a standard iPhone alarm. So I'd set the alarm and I'd only go and feed them once that alarm went off. Um, and it worked. Eventually they started associating the sound of the iPhone alarm with food. So whenever they heard it, they'd r jump up and rush to the kitchen. Um, what I didn't expect though is that it didn't really work as in even though they associated the sound with food, it didn't stop them from being hungry the rest of the time. So they'd still be annoying and irritating, um, 
even though they didn't hear the sound. Um, so I kind of stopped that um, experiment. But even now, and it's like three, four years later, it still works. Whenever they hear the, that iPhone alarm on TV or on the movie, they'll jump up and rush to the kitchen expecting to get food. Um, luckily, it's not used that often anymore because it's one of the old iPhone sounds, but it still happens. So we're not really that different from cats. And we use the same principles on ourselves for habit forming. So for instance, each morning when I'm in bed, I hear my alarm clock and I know that that means I need to get up. Then as developers, we know that when we have failing tests, that means that we should go and fix them. Now, this is a really simple loop though. The question is, how do we actually um, learn what those actions are? And how do we learn new things? So here's a diagram of a slightly more complex agent, a learning agent. So again, we have different elements. Um, the main one here is the performance element. And this is pretty much the agent that you saw before. It has, again, the idea of um, um, creating a state of the world, the condition action rules, and being able to decide what actions take. It's only wrapped up now in one element to make it a little bit more easier to understand. So in this case now, we can change any of the components within the performance element through the learning element. So this modifies these components so that it learns how to make better decisions. We then have the critic, and this looks at past actions and gives feedback on to the learning element. And finally, we have the problem generator. But what this does, it's responsible for suggesting completely new actions. So if we didn't have this, the agent would just remain doing what it thinks is best rather than exploring new things. So this is very much for the experimental things. So again, we can look at it in the same way for the unartificial. And we can talk about it in a bit more human terms. So we have the main decision element, which is control. We have a part that's looking at reflection, a part of understanding, and part of planning. So what we're mainly interested in here is the learning element. How do we define these things? And how does it learn what changes to make? So this is where learning algorithms come in. So there are a couple that you might already have heard of. So supervised learning. So in this case, all the feedback that the algorithm gets is up front. You get a lot of training data. Um, you get a lot of labeled training data. And you're basically trying to infer which input belongs to which output. So as a very basic explanation, if on the left you have shapes as your input, you then have labels saying whether or not it's a circle, a square, or a triangle. Um, so you're basically creating a mapping between your input and what label you have. So then when a new input comes along, you can go, hey, I know this shape, it's a square. We then have unsupervised learning. And in this case, the feedback is just a bunch of data. There's no labels. There's no um, mapping to a specific output. It, all we need to do, well, all the algorithm in this case, what it needs to do is identify patterns and structures from that data. So again, a simple example is we have a bunch of shapes. And it would infer that all the circles belong together and all the rest um, belongs together purely because it can see that some have edges and some don't. Um, so it's looking at different features and finding commonalities between those features. And then we have reinforcement learning. And that's kind of most similar to how humans learn. Um, so rather than having correctly labeled data, we have actual proper feedback. So the agent makes a decision and then gets feedback whether or not it's wrong or right. So it's a much more general way of learning. But it also, at the same time, needs to have a better understanding of how the world works around them. And it needs something to tell them 
what's wrong or what's right. So most of the time it's human input that does that. So again, simple example. So on our left we have our shapes and the agent basically just goes past all the different options and then gets feedback back whether or not it's right or wrong and eventually learns from, um, from that feedback what the mapping should be. So in the same way that machines learn through different types of algorithms, humans learn through different types of activities. So here's a quick overview of 16 different types of learning activities. And I'll just highlight a couple here because we don't have time to go through all 16 of them. Um, but most of them are the names kind of explain what they are. Um, so the first is delivered. And this is the one that most people consider uh, when they're learning something new. So this is when learners are presented with information, with content. So this is quite similar to supervised learning in the sense that there's content which contains all the information you need. So at Future Learn, we do this through different steps um, on courses. Um, so showing videos, showing articles, um, showing audio files. So it's very much about delivered content that people can consume. Um, and as developers, we do the same thing when learning something new. We read books, we read articles, we read, watch videos. Um, so again, it's all about consuming content and learning through that content. The next one that we can talk about is conversational and collaborative learning. So in this case, it's about learning by conversing with others and learning by collaborating with others and constructing a shared understanding. So this is very similar to unsupervised learning. So again, at FutureLearn, we do that by um, comment friends. Um, so on every step that we have, we encourage people to talk about the things that they've learned and basically learn through the social conversations that they're having. And again, as developers, we do that through pairing. So again, conversing with others and constructing a shared understanding. The third one I want to talk about is assessing. So in this case, it's receiving constructive feedback. And again, this is similar to reinforcement learning. So again, we, um, yeah, we get feedback um, and we learn from that feedback. Um, so future learn, we do that with peer review steps. So learners can submit an essay or a poem or whatever the assignment requires, and you get feedback back from other learners. And as developers, again, we do the same thing with pull requests. We put out a pull request and receive constructive feedback, well, hopefully constructive, um, from other developers. So here are, again, eight of the 16 that you saw before. Um, so there are just a couple examples of the kind of activities you do when you're learning. Um, so I said before, I'm not going to go through all of them, but they'll be in the slides if you want to check it out later. And I just want people, though, to quickly reflect on this and think about what's the last time you learned something? What type of learning activity was that? Um, and which of these things aren't you doing? And which of these things might you learn better from? So finally, it's what makes us different from machines? There's a lot that we are do that, are, that, that is the same, but what makes us better right now? So for starters, contextual learning. So anything new we learn, we know in what situations, in what context we're learning it. So unlike machines, we're not bound to one domain or one purpose. So when we learn something in one field, we can actually extrapolate and apply what we've learned to other fields. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's less domain specific than what machines currently can do. Next to that, we're constantly learning. So we don't have an off switch for learning. It's not like machines that have a very specific input state and a learning state and then a output and action state. Um, even though we might not consciously be learning new skills or knowledge, we are processing everything the entire time and we're learning from everything around us. 
even now, just looking at people's faces here, I'm learning whether or not some slides work or other slides don't. Um, whereas machines are very much state-based and they need to be in specific states to learn something. So next to that, we have prior knowledge. We have this huge backlog of things that we know because we've got an entire lifetime of things that we've learned. And again, we can make associations between different types of information that we find. And we can discover patterns and connections in ways that other people might not. Next to that, we're emotional, which doesn't <coughs> necessarily seem like a um, thing that people would consider when is valuable for learning. But we actually attach value and um, emotion to certain skills and information and experiences that we've had in the past. And it's actually proven that the people that, there's been um, research done into um, um, people that um, have damaged parts of the brain and lack the emotional um, processing capability. And they actually make worse decisions. And so we need that emotion to be able to make good decisions. And next to that, we're social. We learn from other people. We learn from everything around us. Um, which at the moment machines don't really do. So we started creating machines that have these abilities in very small different ways, but none of them have all of this combined. So machines have to be able to do all these things in a much more generalized way before we can consider them learning as the way we do. And I don't think we're that far off. Um, so I'm going to make a little prediction. Within the next century, I think we will have artificial intelligence that um, learns like we do. So it won't be the type of artificial intelligence that plots our downfall and causes our species to die out. But rather, we'll have AI that can learn and reason um, about skills and knowledge like we as humans do. And I think that's when things get really, really interesting. Because in a world where humans and machines learn the same way, does that also mean that humans and machines will actually learn together? Will our schools become places where both humans and machines learn? And will those with artificial intelligence be treated the same way as those with unartificial intelligence? So when we're thinking about web design of the future. Consider this. Will what, we are, well, will what we design and develop for humans also be used by machines? And will what we design and develop for humans also work for machines? Or do we need to approach this completely differently? So that's it. <coughs> Thanks for listening. Any questions? I have a question. Um, I, I read the book uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow um, a year ago or so. I don't know if you read that. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, the basic, I mean, the underlying the book is um, uh, the discussion of how important the subconscious mind is to our basic function. Um, and I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts about how computing might be more integrated with our subconscious being rather than our conscious mind. <coughs> and if not, <laughs> that question. <laughs> because I have a feeling that, that the, the current computing technology is much more lined up with the way our subconscious mind works than with the way our conscious mind works, and that in terms of the evolution of an integrated, computed, and uh, carbon-based intelligence, that might be an interesting path. Well, I guess there's, there's a question there whether or not being intelligent means that you're also conscious. Right. Which is an interesting thing I find. It's like, yeah. can you actually ha maybe have artificial <coughs> intelligence which isn't aware of itself? So it still is able to learn and reason, but right. isn't aware that it's learning and reasoning. Um, so yeah, the question about consciousness, I think, is, is a step beyond that. So I think maybe if the current computer systems that we have are like 
our subconscious. Artificial intelligence is kind of the in-between step. And then there's a proper consciousness level about that, I think. Um, at least I think that's, that's how I see it. Any other questions? Yeah, you said that you thought it would take uh, a century or so for artificial intelligence to develop. Do you, do you really think it will take that long? Or do you I, the, I, I'm saying within the century. Oh, within the century? Yeah. Um, so I think the current predictions that I saw was in the 2040s. That's kind of when people are thinking um, we'll get artificial intelligence. Um, <coughs> yeah, according to the experts. But presumably it doesn't suddenly arrive as in one day it's there and one day it's not. So no. what is the foreseen, what is the roadmap like? I don't know. The, there's, there's, uh, there's some interesting um, developments already right now. Like, have you seen, have you, have you guys heard about um, Google's DeepMind? So DeepMind is a project. Um, it's currently being used to, they're basically training it currently to be able to play any Atari game. Um, which sounds a bit silly, but it's actually one algorithm that they're training to play any game. Um, and there's an interesting graph showing which games it now can do better than humans and which ones it's still struggling with. Um, so there's about, I guess, 30, 40 games in it, and it's about halfway there with which ones it can do better than us. Um, but it's completely based on reinforcement learning. Um, so something going, well, it's, it's learning from um, the feedback that it gets from the game um, on how to play it, um, which is really interesting. Um, and they're starting to look at how can we apply these type of um, algorithms to learning other stuff. Um, and then there's things like IBM Watson, um, which is basically starting to learn how doctors think and being able to not replace doctors, but replace the ability to read papers and build a knowledge based on all the medical research that's out there. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things, I think. So I get this uh, fact that when someone's in a excited emotional state, in a positive excited emotional state, they're more likely to have the learning reinforced, which kind of makes me wonder how does the, the sort of our emotional being fit within this idea of artificial intelligence? Because uh, a lot of what we perceive of artificial intelligence is quite sort of like Spock and yeah. very mechanical and very logical. Um, so. Yeah, so my own background is in facial expression recognition. And yeah. It was very much from that perspective that for computers to be able to reason, it will need to first understand what emotions are and yeah. being able to recognize those in people. Um, so there's an entire research area which is just focused on getting, well, getting computer systems to recognize emotions. Um, and I think that's the first step in, in being able to use emotions itself. Yeah. Um, but there are certain types of reinforcement learning where the reinforcement is structured as emotion. Um, so it's basically negative and positive type of um, feedback that it gets back. Um, and you can kind of, it's mainly the negative feedback that you can start describing in different types of emotion. Because positive of emotion is just one, it's happy. Um, it's looking at it from a basic emotion yeah. um, state. And I guess it's the whether that's quite relevant to sort of turning machines into something that's much more capable of learning. Yeah, I think it's one aspect of it, um, and it's eventually all the different parts have to come together to <coughs> to to really be able to learn. I think. The APs will be happy. <laughs> yeah. So it it seems like a lot of the principles of machine learning derived from observations about how we humans learn. Are there types of learning that machines can do that we can't? Um, yeah, I guess so. I was thinking about maybe like, like brute force learning that machines can parse and process a lot more information than we can much more quickly. Yeah, so that's the, so again, going back to the Google DeepMind, mm -hmm. it's, um, 
interesting seeing which um, games it's mastered over humans because it's just figured out how to what the optimal um, reaction is for every situation. So breakout, for instance, it will always win because it can figure out what's the most efficient way to get all the little blocks <coughs> disappeared. Oh, so it's exhaustively explored every possibility. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's obviously a chance that, well, I think it's more likely that AI will become <coughs> smarter than we do and learn at a much faster rate than we do, rather than it's staying at the same level as us and us really learning side by side because they're just going to be way quicker than we are. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Go ahead, I have already asked that. I was going to say, do you think that's in our interest? So you can take them through as an example, let's say AI can suddenly become an <coughs> programmer overnight. Do you think it's in human nature of interest? to encourage AI to develop to a point where it can actually learn quicker than we can? Um, I think it is, because we want it to take over, I think, things that we don't want to do. And you know, having AI being able to help with problems that we currently can solve would be extremely <coughs> beneficial for us. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to put limits in place um, as to how fast and what it is learning and what type of things it's learning. But it's kind of the same thing as you know, um, raising a child. You know, it depends on what we teach and what we put in as to <coughs> how the AI responds and what its values are. In the same way you, you can you know, turn a kid into a massive jerk when it grows up, you can do the same thing with an AI. Um, you know, we, you could create a kid that's a serial killer in the same way you could create an AI that's a serial killer and turns us into, uh, um, well, plots the downfall of us. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just approaching it in the kind of most human ways possible, I guess. That's a bit of a downer to end on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, one thing that's um, itching to ask is, um, you know, because computers are kind of targeted at narrow domains, um, one of the concepts of kind of very quick jump step evolution is the idea of the singularity and machines and improving on machines. Um, could the singular, could the narrow domain of machine be focused on building the evolution of the machine? And it, it, are we at all close to that? Because then, then you could see a big jump quickly? Not that I'm aware of yet, but I can imagine it happening. Yeah, um, yeah I can imagine certain <coughs> systems only, not necessarily working together, but clashing together and causing problems, I guess. Um, but yeah, haven't really thought about that in that sense, actually. Okay. Well, I have an um, I have a recommendation a talk <coughs> about, the about the subject. There is a very amazing talk from uh, the last year is online uh, from the people from Microsoft. How they apply reinforcement learning on Kinect. Basically, w we without noticing when we do a movement, and maybe we don't do the perfect movement to the right or something, do we do something like this, uh, and then just after the movement, we do the opposite movement to go back because we, I mean, the, the Kinect fail. Kinect learns for us and th that from the way we move. And we learn that me, I used to raise my hand slightly to the roof when I go to one to, when I want to go to the right. So it applies a correction of my movements <laughs> when you recognize my movement. So. Very cool. So let's hear again from Linda.